likes that, and we can uh, look at some pictures. Um, thank you, Ted. Uh, I'd like to thank uh, Will and Amrak. Uh, Faye McElmont uh, is ill tonight. She won't be able to be with us, but I thank her. And uh, Jim Prendergast, who's doing the, uh, the tech stuff in the back there. Thank you, Jim. Um, also, thanks to Diana Ingalls. I think she helped uh, recommend me for this, for this gig. I really appreciate it. And most of all, thank you for everybody coming out tonight. Um, I really appreciate you being here. So while I'm talking, I'm going to show some landscapes from Kansas, and then we're going to launch into some projects that I did based off the landscape, landscape experience. Does it sound good for everybody? Okay. All right, good. Um, if there's anything that would come out of tonight, I would hope that uh, somebody or many of you might take away a little bit of inspiration to do something or see something differently. Um, that's really what the story is about tonight. I'm going to show you some uh, landscapes and some projects that um, came out of inspiration from other people, reading ideas in books or hearing them, either hearing their music, um, looking at their pictures, or cross-fertilizing ideas, um, sitting in a lecture like this. So I hope that that uh, synergy continues and you take it home with you and perhaps you might do something with that. These, uh, these landscapes are selections from about 20 years of painting in, uh, in Kansas. Painting, painting can be a relatively solitary experience and um, partly to counterbalance that, I've often reached out into other disciplines out of my own curiosity, but also to, to mix up the energy and to revitalize what I was doing and, and to learn. So with a nod to Will, the learning is indeed a lifelong experience. Um, I can vividly remember the moment uh, when I was on the campus of the University of Wisconsin-Madison um, when I decided I wanted to go into painting full-time, specialize in it. Uh, at the time I was a Russian language major and I was, I was good at it. Yeah. But, uh, there was something about it, you know, I sang in the Slavic choir and I could say, you know, Russian thing. Kapi Pozhevayetsya, Bogdan, all that stuff. Um, but I noticed something about the uh, other people in the class, they had a passion for it. And I really admired that in them. And I realized I was walking down Bascom Hill towards the library. And some of you I know have been in Madison. And I said to my, and this is an idea, thought that came into my mind. And it was that I want to do something that I imagine myself doing when I'm older, very old. And I thought, I owe that to myself. You know, I mean, I can do this other stuff, but I thought, you know, I just really feel this energy rolling in me. I'm going to do, you know, and I'm going to just work with this. Um, and it's been 40 years since then, and I'm rolling on it still. And uh, I, I really like that feeling. So, so anyway, here's to Will for carrying on that energy. And it's not just with the making of it. I think what's kept me going a lot of times, or what's added to it, is teaching it. Uh, because in teaching it, you're also in contact with other people. I'm going to show some slides later. Notice I still say slides, that dates me. Um, show some slides later and uh, about some teaching experiences. Um, when you teach, you have to listen to your own BS. So you really have to be on your toes and you, you weed out the, the crap, you know, because people call you on it or you call yourself on it. So let's think about what painting is. Um, sometimes I like to play a game in my mind and I imagine that painting, as much as I like history, and I'm a real student of art history and history in general, I play this game where I say, what if painting was like invented last week, you know? Like last week, it was invented in Brazil or Long Island or someplace. And, you know, you get the Sunday New York Times, you get the Times and there's a culture section and they have an article about this new media, painting. So how would they talk about it? 
You know, and in this fantasy world, photography is already around, digital arts around, dance, movies, everything. But painting was all of a sudden invented by some people. You know, how would they, how would they be describing it? Um, these are some, these are some dried grasses in Kansas. Um, so when it gets very windy there, and you can't paint, um, you know, the best thing to do is to get low on the ground and paint right on the ground. So I'd be like, like this. And it becomes very abstract, like Cy Twombly or some other abstract painters, but absolutely delicious to get involved with. Um, so where were we were talking about painting and defining painting. So we would be reading the Times, and um, I think that what one thing that would come out, and of course, this would all be described in contemporary concepts, is. What makes it a particularly expressive force? What is it about it that makes it a, a viable, different kind of expressive medium? You know, because we've got all these other expressive media, medias. And what strikes me from the area of cognitive science is that you've got um, you've got vision going on, and you've got you know we're able to see about 10 million colors, and you've got very little technology between your imagination and your hand manipulating all these colors. You know, it's a pl very plastic medium. I mean, you can get all those colors in film and photography, but what you've got with painting is you've got the body. And you, and you, you don't have your printing press that can alter things, or a camera that decides things, and all that technology. You are in control of it for better or worse, okay? And that force is, I think, you, you know, very unique. I don't think it is, I, I know it is. So, sure. There we go. Um, I call this cracked and warped landscape because I usually I'm pretty careful about my materials, but I got carried away and I, got, I put a thin layer of paint and started to crack, and I put it in the frame and then the frame warped and it was really appropriate. <laughs> and uh, so it's cracked and warped landscape. I'll never. I'll, it'll be with me till I die. I love this little painting. Um, sunset. Um, Another, uh, let me have my notes here. Another uh, interesting thing about it is that the musicians, and again the scientists would look at it and say, wow, you've got all these, you've got like a color-based media, but you don't notate it like music is notated because we, we see colors differently than we hear sounds. And there's too many colors and they're moving too quickly for us to make sense of them in terms of notation. There's no mathematics that correlate to our emotional responses to colors. So we've had this entire history of art proceed without any kind of notation. And artists get along fine without it. And the musicians kind of think that was kind of cool. Um, imagine music without notation. Um, so this is like the kind of exercise I'd offer to my students to say, how would you define painting? Um, imagine it being new. So, like I said, I, I left Wisconsin and then I went to Tyler School of Art in Philadelphia and got my undergraduate degree. And there I met Diana Ingalls. And um, we were, I think, both pretty... I, I, I had lunch with Diana after I moved here. And I've been vacationing here for some time. But I, and I knew that she had a store here. And it was great to run into her, to her about 10 years ago, maybe. And then I moved here and we had lunch. And, and I, we, we kind of compared notes about what we remembered about each other in class. And she said, I remember you talked a lot. <laughs> I took that as a compliment. Um, but we both had fond memories of, of teachers. And uh, I'm really happy to be working with Diana on mural projects throughout town. She's, as you know, she's got this wonderful combination of ceramic and painting that's kind of a, uh, makes things sparkle. And it's, it's great to work with kids again and with murals. My first job after graduate school was painting murals for the city of Baltimore. And uh, that, was a, that was a trip. So I'm glad to be back doing that again. Um, but after, uh, I went, then I went to, to Baltimore for um, graduate school and got my MFA and did a bunch of work. And I had paintings that would get into you know, competitions and 
they would do well, and I'd have some group shows, some individual shows, but it took me a while. Um, it took me about, I don't know, eight years or so before I, I realized that I really wasn't um, getting to the depth I wanted to from day to day. You know, I was, I was kind of like, uh, I felt like I was gearing up for individual pieces and, you know, like trying to hit a home run, but I really wasn't hitting singles and doubles. And I wanted to find out more about that, like what it would be like. And, and I realized um, a few things while I was taking a minor break from painting. I, I, one thing led to another. As Ted said, I, I played a lot of music and I play you know, guitar and drums and keyboard and things. And I, this, this is you know, one of these little twists of fate, how things happen. I was, uh, I was with a friend of mine and we were in a church and this, the music director got up and it was this little church in the middle of Baltimore and there were probably about ten and a half people in the church, you know. And this guy gets up and he says, uh, we're looking for help for the Saturday night service, Catholic Church. And the music was very good, so I wanted to meet him. And I thought, oh, I could, I could help this guy out, you know. So after the service, I introduced myself. And it turns out that the man was um, the director of the Peabody... Um, the computer music concert for the Peabody Conservatory in Baltimore, which is not a bad person to, to meet. And we, uh, we started this great friendship. And I did the Saturday night gig for him for a couple years, and he was very grateful. And he said, you know, you can take any kind of classes you want to. And it, it, at, at Peabody or Goucher College, where he also had some, some classes, and uh, I thought, great, this was in the mid-80s. This was before Macintosh, you know, really came out. And, uh, and, and so everything was still a, a C prompt, you know, command prompt. And at the time, I was getting out of arts administration, and I, was, I found employment as a typesetter. And this was when typesetting was hard-coded. You know, you didn't have WYSIWYG computers. Some of you might not even know what WYSIWYG means. The, the younger generation means what you see is what you get. This is before you saw screens with stuff happening in real time. You'd have a C prompt and then you'd have to code in all this stuff about how big you wanted to type and what type font. So you had to be good at that. And I could type like 120 words a minute, so I got jobs easily. So I was familiar with computers. And then I get into this computer music lab and it was like a, a, a dream come true. I mean, it's a room half this size with just banks of synthesizers, all the latest computers in the world. And I could, I took classes in, you know, the physics of music and com computer music, and and then at, at night once a week, I was able to go out to the Aberdeen Proving Grounds where Johns Hopkins University and Johns Hopkins and Peabody are, are related, and uh, they had a they had a um, arrangement with the Aberdeen Proving Grounds, the Army facility out there, that uh, some sort of quid pro thing, I don't know. And I would go out and work with three-dimensional computer graphics on Cray computers. And now, we probably have that much power in our IMAX, but back then it was really a big deal to have three-dimensional graphics going. So computers were familiar to me, and I was, I was uh, like I said, t kind of like at a, at a minor crisis point with painting. And I thought, you know, I really should start painting like I play music or play sports. So I've always liked sports too. And I started to look, and all of a sudden the light bulbs went off like crazy that I could train myself to paint. Like a, unlike any kind of painting teaching that I'd had in college. Um, in the 70s and 80s, the 1970s and 80s, um, <laughs> we were you know, there was a very fast track if you had an ability to paint representationally. People really wanted to put you on a fast track to conceptual art and abstraction. And that was all very fine and good. But I thought there was some hydroplaning going on there inside of me. And I really wanted to get some, literally, more traction. So what I did was I started, um, I did this series of abstract paintings that took about four or five years. And I cut up hundreds and hundreds of these little masonite panels, you know, like this big or smaller. And I'd be in my apartment and I would, I made up rules, you know, this is what I'm going to do. Here's I'm going to explore texture, I'm going to explore color, I'm going to explore brush strokes, 
and I'm gonna break it down, boom, 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 and I'm not gonna get uptight about it. This is just like playing musical scales or, or doing wind sprints for an athletics competition. That's just what I would do. And I, would, I, would, I didn't have any hang-ups about being unoriginal or being the latest, greatest painter or anything like that. I just taught myself, I retaught myself painting and kind of incorporated it into my own self. Um, this is a, when I was in Kansas, I was sort of a self-described ditch painter. Kansas, unlike New Mexico, you can throw a rusted nut into the ground and the next morning you'll have a Volkswagen. I mean, <laughs> you can grow anything in Kansas and it is so humid and wet and fertile and these ditches would just, you know, it's like I would find a hundred yard stretch of gravel road and I just I'd fall in love for the entire summer. And this is from one stretch of road that I just absolutely adore. And I would go there, and it would be hot and humid, and the bugs were all over. Um, it was really, really beautiful. So, so anyway, I did this in Baltimore, and then I sort of segued into doing some imaginary landscapes. And and this went on for a couple of years. And then by the time I was I was married at the time, and my ex was from Kansas, and my kids were young, and we wanted to get out of Baltimore, and uh, so we're going to Kansas. And so I went to Kansas, and I just fell in love with the landscape. And all of a sudden, all of a sudden, all the stuff that I, all the little, um, you know, uh, things that I learned in painting, um, the chops that I learned about, you know, breaking things down, they all came to life for me, and I was able to to put them to use in painting the landscape. Um, Basically, I'd drive around until I found something cool, or I'd, I'd get out of the car and I'd walk around, and it was a lot like hunting or fishing. I'd wait, my gut would tighten up, and I, you know, I'd find something, and you get this tension, and then I'd just set up my easel and work for anywhere between 30 minutes to three hours. And I wouldn't edit much. I didn't want to edit much. I, back to music, I wanted to keep it like a performance. I wanted to see, okay, this is, this is it. You know, it's gonna happen here, it's not gonna happen. And I didn't want to. I didn't want to take it back to the studio and start, you know, making it something else. If I had something that really bothered me, basically I'd save it for the next time and just make a mental note. I go, okay, don't do that again, um, or do this some more. Whatever the case was. I also, back to music and and, and athletics, working smaller means you get to do more reps. So you get to you get the whole process going again and again. Instead of doing six big paintings for the year, I do like 80 paintings. And you get more chances to start and finish, and then you, you refine, and you, you work on your chops, and you do this and you do that, um, so on and so forth. Okay. Now comes the part where I've got to zip through some slides to get through these projects that I've been talking about. So I'm gonna zip through a bunch of paintings until we get to spin-offs. And by the way, after when the lights go on, I've got some, for those in the back, I've got some original pieces here up in the front along the floor if you want to take a look at those things. I do, I do larger canvases. In fact, I'm working on some now. But most of these were relatively small. This is a 13 by 13 inch painting here. And this is looking down in the water. If you look down in the water, you get a whole different palette you're looking at because the colors are different. You don't have a horizon line. Lines are coming in from every which way. And you see the dome of the sky. Because if you're painting outwards, you see the horizon line. You're only seeing about five degrees of the sky. So if you look down, there's a whole different world for painting. Asters in the fall. Oxbow Lake. President Obama was in Lawrence, Kansas today. L rough leaf dogwood. Arrowhead. Sage. The tornado was coming this day. So here's what I mean about the dome of the sky. You know, I'm looking down in the water, but you can see this tornadic sky happening. And it, 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 talk about making it real. You're really hurried, you know, when you're doing this. <laughs> You have an invested interest in getting the hell out. Okay, so here we go. Here's some projects. Okay, um, 
So like I said, part of my reaching out was uh, I felt like I needed to connect with people. And I was self-conscious about doing landscape painting. You're at an MFA, you know, you're, you, know, you're, you want to be hip looking. And uh, I was a middle-aged guy painting landscapes. You know, how, how, do you, how do you square that with some things? I didn't feel like I was, you know, uptight about it. But, you know, I did a lot of people were dissing me because I think, oh, he's a landscape guy. And the word, you know, came to the point where the word plein air made me cringe, you know, because, you know, I think plein air and maybe a little umbrella or something like that. And I was, I was crawling underneath barbed wire with chiggers crawling up my pants and risking heat stroke and, you know, screw plein air. I mean, I was, you know, this is, this is something else. It wasn't plein air. Um, so, I wanted to find connections between what my interests and what other people were doing in contemporary thinking. And my, my day job is I'm a, a graphic designer, specifically a typesetter for scholarly books and journals. So I, get, I have all these texts in front of me all the time, and a lot of my friends work for the University of Kansas, so I had all, a lot of academic ideas going through my head. And um, uh, my feeling was I was making pictures that were kind of witnessing of unspectacular beauty. Uh, it was a life where I lived. I was living these landscapes. And uh, I felt I had to be a student of it. I loved it. And, but I, I, was, like, I wanted to reach out. So um, one, the connection between imagination, geography, place, painting, poetry kind of came together in 1999 and led to something called this Kansas Conference on Imagination and Place, which I organized. And, before my, my geographer friend Garth Myers left for Africa, he's, a, um, ten, he's an East African specialist, fluent in Swahili and everything. I asked Garth for some recommendations for reading, and he gave me some books on geography and philosophy. And I said, great, I'll pick them up. And then he said, you know, what you're doing, Paul, with these landscapes is you're creating your own geography. Because not only was I going out and looking at things, I was accumulating lots of uh, field work study. I was talking to people, I was learning about the history, the geography, the community issues, politics, land use, uh, so on and so forth. And he was right. And, I, and uh, so he left for the summer. I read for the summer. And, and then in the fall, I combined what I was reading with the suggestions of uh, a poet, Robert Kelly, who's in the upper right. And Kelly had this little, he's a, he's a teacher at Bard College in New York. And he had this little essay called Hypnogeography. He was talking to kind of a, uh, I forgot what institute in New York. Uh, and, and he said, what happened if we had a geography that included everybody's dreams of places? And you know, what would that be like? And I, I said, let's do that. And I was in Lawrence. And the long story short is that the Kansas Land Trust and the Lawrence Art Center, the community art center there where I was teaching, uh, jumped all over this idea. And I said, let's literally get a bunch of dreams together and call all these people together and talk about this stuff because it seems to be in the air, you know? And this was a long time before placemaking was a buzzword at the NEA, you know, I'm proud to say. And, and so that's what we did. We, uh, we wrote letters, I, I wrote letters to Robert Kelly and these other people and uh, we had an amazing conference. Uh, this is uh, Ed Casey in the upper left is a, uh, a philosopher from uh, SUNY, uh, State University of New York, Stony Brook. And going back to the times of Leonardo where he says, okay, here's how you paint a battle scene. Here's how you do the smoke. You know, make sure the horses get smaller as you go in the distance. And then you got one rearing up in the hind legs with a teeth bare. You know, that's how you do it. That's what I did with these people and they really loved it. They got into it. And they had perfect clothing. And <laughs> they just looked great. And there's a student of mine at the Lawrence Art Center. Um, I was invited to teach in Israel one year. I was a, a guest of honor at their annual landscape painting marathon for the Jerusalem Studio School. And my friend Craig Hampton, who's Jewish, said the top top photo is like, how many Jews does it take to watch a Gentile teach them how to paint? <laughs> so uh, if you've never been to Israel, uh, it's an amazing experience. And if you know the history of you know uh, Zionism and the you know the state of Israel, it's an amazing place. I mean, these people are from around the world, and it was in the middle of the summer. It was beastly hot, 
and where they'd set up all day, where they worked their fannies off from eight to six, two hours for lunch, which is great, and then we'd have these critiques in the middle of the day. And they didn't want to have any bullshit. They wanted to know that Paul, don't tell me my, tell me what's wrong with my paintings. I want to learn. And so you can see these guys are of all ages. Um, this woman up here, his name I can't recall, she's one of my favorites. She was from Argentina. And boy, was she, she had a personality just like her hair. I mean, she was just out there. Big hugs every day, you know. This is New Mexico, um, obviously. So here I am on the, the road down to Lordsburg and doing a painting, getting used to the colors here. So like Kansas, I'm trying to get to know my home territory. And I'm taking a picture of my car. This is my glamour shots of my, my vehicle. It's like a car ad, you know. So I take these once in a while because even with the beat up old truck, when the sun's going down, it looks great. So this is a, a landscape on the way to Lordsburg, no, not Lordsburg, um, San Lorenzo. An arroyo near the Saddle Rock Canyon. This is again near San Lorenzo. Saddle Rock. I think these two paintings are down in the front. And then last but not least, I did this, um, coming out here, I wanted to do something that combined my interest in water with the, what, I was, what I had observed in the Middle East in 2009. And there's this funny parallel between, um, not a funny parallel, but a parallel between architecture in the Middle East and the privacy of the, the Spanish um, kind of architecture you hear. And so I created this oasis in my house. I built this, fish tank, and I bought tile from Syzygy, and, um, what's that? Phone. Phone. <laughs> um, your clue phone's ringing, pick it up. Um, so I, I was traveling across country on my way here, and I stopped at the Cleveland Museum of Art, and I fell in love with these Italian Renaissance silks, this line of tile, and I thought, I'm gonna do this in my house. You know, why don't I, 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 I pretended I was, uh, you know, a high-ranking uh, uh, Venetian prince or something like that. And I built this oasis in my house, and I filled it with koi. And I would paint, and then I would take photographs of them, I'd paint some more, I'd document my photos, my paintings, I'd pull them into Photoshop, manipulate the images around, um, think about it some more, and these are some individual fish that I painted. And I wanted to have, them be a, have a real 19th century feel. Mm -hmm. And then I would combine them with other images or paintings that I'd done. And one of them is up front here. So, um, and then I had them printed in town here, Lumiere Editions. Did some archival printing of these images. Um, did a really fine job with them. And that's it. <laughs> Okay, so let's have some questions, and maybe I have answers. Paul, well, I have a question for you. Yeah, yeah. Just before I retired in Tucson, I was pursuing an associate's degree in fine arts, and the first class was Drawing 101. And next to me was a Korean, South Korean lab. And when the instructor gave us the instructions, we all started with our pencil. But my Korean colleague sitting next to me sat, and he stared, and he stared, and he stared at this piece of paper. I got worried. I thought maybe he was having a stroke or didn't understand the instructions. All of a sudden, draw like crazy and this beautiful drawing came about. Yeah. So that leads me to my question. How do you as a painter start painting? What drives you to pick up that paintbrush and that canvas to start? Well, it's real expressive. It's real, it's real like visceral. And what I do, and one of the things I discovered, one of my chops, so to speak, is that I start every painting I do with red, with French vermilion. And I, I give everything a generous bath and medium. And um, I put the medium down, I put the red down, and then I'm in it. The red is blood. The red is the background radiation of the universe. The red is spaghetti sauce. You know, it's all this stuff. And then my job is to bring it from all of that, all of those implications into whatever I'm painting, whether it's a portrait or a landscape or an abstract piece. But I like your friend in the class, I just go right into it. And then there's no holding back. And I figure if I have a stroke, 
At least I've got a painting, you know, they say. <laughs> come on, come on, come on. Questions? Yeah. Just so I asked Richard Kramer and Stephen Green, your instructors, are there any influences on you, any artistic influences? Definitely. I'd say historically, um, uh, as uh, one of the instructors here was pointing out, um, uh, Camille Baptiste Corot from the 19th century French painter, um, and Edvard Munch, strangely enough, because he's, you know, we're, we have some Scandinavian and, and Scottish heritage in our family, and so I was always drawn to his uh, interest in going outside, especially in the wintertime. Um, and then Andy Goldsworthy is a British artist who works, um, he, he doesn't do paintings, he does these interesting things with uh, found objects, and the pieces are very ephemeral, they're meant to melt away or float down the stream. Um, and then, it, you know how, um, you're a writer, and as you know, I mean, it can be an indirect current between those influences and your work. You may not necessarily write like them, but they, they press that trigger and then they make you get into your desk and write. So there's a number of painters, I mean a trip through any museum, or sometimes you might even see a little painting in the barber shop or something like that, you know, and you just fall in love with the way somebody did a chicken. You go, oh, okay, I better, let's go do that. So, but, uh, and Phil Augustine is also an American painter um, who had an amazing second half to his career and a uh, very juicy paint. And the, the California painters, uh, David Park, um, some of the other Californians, figurative painters from the uh, 1950s, Richard Devencorn, figurative painter from California. Um, and I'm more of a Matisse guy than a Picasso guy, although I like Picasso's neoclassical drawings a lot. Yeah. Yes? Yeah, right now I'm working on about 10 really large canvases. They're about um, five by six feet and they're water-based and they have to do with um, my experiences on the Oregon coast and uh, Sapia Canyon, the creek that's up in Sapia Canyon. So they're different, um, uh, no, I'm not making a pun, different reflections on water and, and, and the experiences of being around the water. I mean, in the Oregon coast, you have continent making. You know, you've got this incredible force of you know waves and energy coming across the Pacific and battering the coastline. And but visually, you also have this phenomenon of you get encrypted the greatest contrast possible. You've got pure, pure white foam against black, black rock, and looking down at it. And then you've got these sea palms that are moving like this and taking this battering in the surf. You know, so that that's one idea of water. And then there's another idea of water, which is you know, a stream like Sapir Creek, and you watch this gentle stream of water going by. And that relates to, you know, all kinds of concepts of, you know, this living in the moment, letting things go, and stuff like that. And so, I'm working from photographs, and what I'm doing is not painting from the photographs, but I'm just, having been in both of these places, studying the photographs and thinking what makes streamness, you know, visually, and just kind of internalizing that. And so then putting all the photographs behind, and then, and then, and then painting. And uh, I had a really uh, great good fortune last week. I was contacted by a, uh, an outstanding student here at Jensen, and uh, he wanted to do an internship with me as part of his program. So Jensen's now coming over. And he's helping me with these larger canvases, you know, getting the priming done and everything like that. So um, I'm really excited about that opportunity. So he's helping me with them. So yeah, I'm working on a bunch of large canvases now. No, I, 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 I've tried that, and I, and I do like oils. I mean, I just decided I, I like that. I didn't have any, a lot of people, my friends, do acrylics because of the allergy problem or the irritation, and um, I don't have any problem with that. Like, you know, in 10 years, my skin might fall off, but so far, it's okay. Yes? If you could teach yourself, if you were, if you were teaching graduate school now, and you were teaching yourself as a graduate student as you were then. What would you teach yourself? What would you <laughs> Loaded question. She has inside information. It's my sister. 
I think what was missing was there was, um, and this is what I would teach myself, I would teach the politics of art to get that out of the way. Because I think that um, a lot of younger artists and musicians um, have skills, um, but you can get really, your head can get into a bad space when it gets mixed up with the politics and the business of the, of the business. And I am a business person. I've been running a, a business for 25, 30 years. And, and when I first started, I was a guy with an MFA in painting, and I thought, oh, I guess I got a lot to learn. And I realized, boy, there's a lot of bad business people out there. <laughs> and um, a lot of times if you don't get a break or, or, or you don't get a show or whatever, it's not because of your own work, it's because somebody um, had a deal to make with somebody else or somebody didn't have the money to pay their rent so they had to compromise and do something else. It wasn't anything to do with you. So what I would do is I would, I would teach people how the game was played and then I would, I would let that take the pressure off their creative effort. So that would be my number one thing. And then once that's done, then you can go in and then you can start talking about fine points about creative effort. And be more honest about, well, you know, you can do this idea, but this is going to be not marketable. But it's cool. It's a great idea. You know, or, and just learn to live with that kind of stuff. So that's, that's what I mean. Yes? Paul, oh, if you were uh, chosen to be the main judge in an art show, yeah. Right. Well, usually I've, I've done that, and sometimes you know, usually people give you some uh, some uh, parameters, and they say, you know, we've got so many categories, and we've got this and that. Um, there's just a there's just a sense you get about work about people you want to work, you want to encourage, and and sometimes it's not the best work. You know, sometimes you know you see a little something, and you go, hmm. You know, I think I'd like to give that a boost. I don't know what it is, but you see something, it just kind of catches your eye and you go, I want to encourage that. And you want to recognize excellence also. Yes, Peter. Maybe this is, maybe this is not appropriate, but I'm going to ask again. No, I'm not going to do it. <laughs> <laughs> we're here for a very short time, maybe a hundred years, and then we're gone. So you must have a, you're an artist, I see, and I'm really amazed at the beauty of it. Thank you. You must have a, some kind of cosmology that, that explains what we're doing here and, and what it's all about. <laughs> Does your art reflect some of these same feelings that you have in your art about what, what life means and what consciousness and, uh, and is it an expression? The answer is yes. <laughs> I have those ideas, and yes, it expresses it. And thanks for asking. And and that's one of the reasons why I work a lot, and it's hard for me not to work. So, yeah. So keep keep moving. This is one of my philosophies. <laughs> yes. Good question. Um, I think especially, I know if people want to go want to make this last question, but it's it's a really good question. And it, it, and it has an impact on the market too, especially with computers. People can, and I do this, I get on Google and I say, okay, I want to um, I want to study uh, oak trees. I just type in Google, oak trees, images, and I get a thousand oak trees. And I can pick and choose and do whatever. So we're saturated with images. And I think that it takes a lot for people to invest in a, an image that is static, so to speak, when they can just turn on a computer and they can see anything they want, switch the channel, change. Right, now, 
So what it does is it, it, it makes me bear down and do a, a good job because the idea is, is why a lot of images are abiding and why people still go to museums is because you realize there is a craft to it. And you can do better than a snapshot. And there's an art to it. And there's a way to put things together so that whenever you look at the painting, it's got enough stuff to it so that you how you changed since you last saw it, you bring something new to it. So it makes you get your act together. It's competition. So, well, thanks so much. Oh, one last question. Good yeah. Yeah, yeah. So what would you tell to an 18-year-old that's interested in art? How would you entice him into going into a career in art? And, and uh, what can you tell him? I mean, with all of this competition, with all of this art coming out of this, media being so dynamic, you know, what is in it there for an 18-year-old and, and trying to pursue a degree in art? I'd be very realistic, and I, I would, I would uh, be very sobering about the prospects for earning money in, a, in an art career. It's almost like telling somebody you see in the playground about, you know, being an NBA star. It's like the, the numbers are pretty daunting. So I've been, it's my good fortune I was in the right place at the right time, and I picked up a lot of clients, prestigious clients, as a graphic designer. To, to, so that I could support my painting habit, because I do sell paintings, but not enough to support myself. So I would be realistic, I'd say, follow your dream, but here's the way the world works. And if you want to do it, you know, you can do both. And a lot of people have done that. They teach or they have another gig, and you know, that's just the way it is. So I would say, go for it, but be realistic and have you know, a balance, because I don't believe, I, I think bohemianism lasts a short period of time. <laughs> And there you go. So thank you very much for coming out.